Hi everyone, my name is Duration and I am the host here of Finta Kauai Show, Finding Our Future. So here on the show we talk about um, sustainability, politics, things that matter to local people and future generations. And we're here every other Tuesday, 1 to 1.30. And today it's Super Tuesday, so I'm really, really excited to talk about um, the 2020 election, especially in terms of Hawaii primaries and just in general having a read on the elections. So my guest today is Bart Dame. Bart, thanks so much for being on here. I'd love if you can just give a quick intro of what you do. Um, well, I wear multiple hats. Um, I, I think for the purposes of this discussion, I'm a longtime Democratic Party activist and I've been involved in a lot of the presidential campaigns in Hawaii over the years. Uh, I'm also, right now, I'm the National Committee Man for the Democratic Party. So when you hear about the evil DNC, uh, I'm one of the members of the DNC from Hawaii. We are the policymaking body for the National Party. There are 400 and, I believe it's 447 members of us. And in addition to members of Congress, we will be, potentially be superdelegates at the Milwaukee National Convention. Okay, well, great segue into um, conspiracy theories about superdelegates and stuff like that. So can you, for people who are confused or um, wary of that whole process, can you just give a rundown if you were to be a superdelegate? Like, is there that risk that people are so worried about? And um, yeah, I just want you to give some some top of the line right. response Yeah, to let that. me give you a little bit of history. Um, the, the official term for what are being called superdelegates uh, had been unpledged delegates. So the unpledged delegates were the Democratic members of Congress, the, uh, including both chambers, the U.S. Senate and the House, uh, Democratic governors, um, a few sort of dignitaries like former party chairs. And in addition, there are about 447 members of the DNC itself. And DNC in this context means the Democratic National Committee. Like I was saying, that is the sort of board of directors for the National Democratic Party. Uh, I believe it was in, in 1984, they created this category of um, unpledged delegates and inserted the politicians and the party leaders into the process as a certain percentage of the national delegates with the idea that the superdelegates might be able to take control of the rudder should the uh, party start heading towards a reef in the nominating process. It was sort of a fail-safe backup system. It wouldn't be enough votes to totally control the process, but enough to put their thumb on the scale in order to ensure that a responsible and electable candidate be elected. Um, that has gone through a lot of changes. There was a lot of controversy in 2016 when the superdelegates, about 93% all lined up behind Hillary Clinton before even a single ballot was cast. And so there was a lot of effort to reform the process, make it more democratic so that the uh, nominee will be elected by a vote of delegates to the National Convention who themselves were apportioned relative to the votes received by the candidates in every state's primary and caucus rather than by these powerful insiders. Um, we tried to abolish the superdelegates completely, but we reached a compromise that said the automatic delegates this time will not be able to vote in the presidential nominating race until the second ballot. So if no candidate goes into the convention with 50% plus, of the pledge delegates, those that are elected as a result of the primary vote and the caucus votes, uh, then the superdelegates can resume our superpowers and uh, vote on the second or subsequent ballots. So you said you guys tried to abolish it. What, I guess from your, your sense of what's happening today, do you have confidence of the system? Are you super, are you also, suspicious of how um, how it will play out because of course there's a lot of the worry that the establishment's anti-Bernie and therefore the superdelegates are used as a fail-safe um, to protect from Bernie, not not a dangerous candidate, but just someone that they don't want to be in power. So what is your read on that? Well, um, I think when we passed this reform, we passed this reform like two years ago after a long process of arguing 
and it was a compromise. And um, I think most of us thought it was a far off possibility that there would be, uh, that superdelegates would ever uh, be reactivated because there'd be a brokered convention. There hasn't been a brokered convention in the Democratic Party since 1952. Um, so there is a risk this year, the way the votes are, are amassing, that no candidate will get at least half, well, half plus of the pledge delegates. Uh, so it may be that superdelegates will reemerge. If the superdelegates do reemerge and do get to vote, they will be about 16% of all the delegates at the national convention. So you can see if there's a close race, even a close within, you know, within heck 16%, it is conceivable if the superdelegates all voted as a block that they could pick their favored candidate. And overwhelmingly, I think a majority of the superdelegates would support the more conservative establishment candidate. In this race, it appears the race is narrowing down to a two-person race between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. We still aren't sure what the heck the role Bloomberg is going to play, but most of the others have dropped out except, of course, for Tulsi and for Elizabeth Warren. What do you think is the what do you think is Bloomberg's and Warren's strategy in staying? Do you think that they're understanding these rules and in some way trying to help Joe Biden? Like what do you think? Or do you think that they just hope that they can convince superdelegates later on that they can win? What is their what do you think that they're trying to do by staying well, in for I so think, long? First I I contrast what's happening with them versus what happened with uh, Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar, um, who dropped out. Right, so they looked at the math, they saw they weren't gaining any traction. Uh, Pete did okay in the first two primaries, but it was clear that he didn't catch on with Latino or with African American voters and had no chance of winning the nomination. So I'm pretty sure that they got all kinds of communications, not just from DNC members, but from their major donors, uh, perhaps from, in the case of Klobuchar, maybe through the uh, Senate colleagues, asking that they drop out in order to help Joe Biden. I think it was very consciously designed to ensure that moderate votes could congeal behind Joe Biden. I mean, this strategy is openly discussed and being promoted in the commercial media. Uh, it's not a secret strategy. Now, in the case of Bloomberg and Elizabeth Warren, they are kind of exceptions. First, it actually helped Joe Biden for um, for Warren to remain in the race, at least through today's vote, uh, because she can collect votes that otherwise would likely go to Bernie. Um, and so the idea, the name of the game right now for all these candidates is to try to keep Bernie from amassing too many delegates. Um, Warren's campaign has put out a memo, which they circulated fairly publicly, which basically acknowledges she doesn't have the chance to win enough uh, delegates herself to win the nomination. So she is angling to make sure we have a brokered convention. And then if she goes to that convention, she seems to think that even if she's, say, fourth in the delegate count, that she is so appealing as a candidate that the superdelegates will swoop in and give her the nomination. Bloomberg has a different strategy, and he's in the category by himself. He's, I believe, the ninth richest man in the United States. He's worth 60 something billion dollars. So he thinks he can basically buy enough ads, convince enough people, probably bribe enough politicians, frankly, uh, that he thinks he might be able to come out of a brokered convention uh, with enough uh, votes so that he might be able to win it. So both of them are aiming to get a brokered convention. I don't think they're aiming so much to directly help Biden get the nomination. I think they both want the nomination, but it serves the interest certainly of Biden for Warren to remain in the race. It does not serve his interest to have Bloomberg in the race because we'll see what happens today, but Bloomberg is likely to draw off a lot of conservative voters who otherwise would vote for Biden. It just, to me, it just is giving me like um, PTSD to go through something like this again. Cause after 2016, when there's pretty, I mean, 70% of folks in Hawaii voted for Bernie Sanders um, and you know, there was all this stuff that came out with Hillary Clinton 
and the DNC in some ways rigging it towards um, to favor Hillary, and then she lost the general election. So I'm getting a little, little bit of PTSD that something similar is happening again. The establishment's getting involved. They're strategizing behind the scenes, using money and power to shift what would have happened if dem democracy had just played out in a cleaner way. And then I'm worried that if Joe Biden or an establishment candidate becomes a nominee, that we'll lose the general election again. So um, I'm looking I for some comfort from you, yeah. some other reactions, just, you know, what are you sensing around well, all of that? I, I think those concerns are, are perfectly valid. Um, what I, I push back sometimes when people say the DNC is going to do this or the DNC is going to do that. Now, under Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the DNC uh, violated its own charter, was not neutral, saw itself as an extension of the Clinton campaign before she had the nomination wrapped up. And that was wrong. But that's generally universally regarded as, by DNC members as having been wrong. Tom Perez, the current chair, is much more sensitive to the image and trying to rehabilitate the image of the DNC as a fair and neutral body. And even though this uh, effort to reform superdelegates originally came out of the Bernie campaign, Perez looked at it and embraced it and saw it as important to clean up the image of the party and the DNC, and particularly to uh, overcome the alienation that young voters were feeling that the Democratic Party was too corrupt for them to get involved in. So that young voters are a core demographic that the Democrats are hoping will turn out in large numbers and help us win, not just the White House, but also control, keep control of Congress and win the U.S. Senate. Do you think that, I mean, it seems like there's kind of two ways that this can play out, right? Bernie could win and there's a whole progressive uprising and, you know, that he wins and maybe he wins a general, but there's another side that's like, okay, well, Joe Biden could win, potentially alienate a lot of the younger, more progressive voters that don't resonate with him, nor the, the complex tactics of um, the way the Democratic Party runs their primary system. But then there's this idea that the down ballot races, like the House, Senate, local races, um, will do better with a Joe Biden nomination. And I don't know enough about that. I, I don't want to believe that it's true because I am personally a Bernie Sanders supporter. Um, but I just want to know, is that, you know, is that true that the down ballot races would probably do better without a Bernie Sanders nomination? Um, okay. just let, let me to, make clear that, that um, I, I said I've worked in various campaigns. I am a volunteer for Bernie's campaign this time. I'm not an officer of that. I'm not, I don't have any official role, but I support Bernie Sanders. And I actually think he is the stronger candidate. Um, I think the dominant corporate media is telling us, yes, uh, Biden is the stronger candidate. And a lot of people buy that because it's we're bombarded with that. I don't think it's true. Um, I don't think, and a, a recent talking point, which only started about 10 days ago, was that a nomination of Biden would help the down ticket races. I don't think that's true. I think that um, the strategy behind Bernie is that by appealing to working class interests, then those voters who were alienated and who've given up on voting either Democrat or Republican, or if instead, if they don't think the Democrats represent their class interests, are open to appeals based on racism or nationalism, homophobia, anti-immigrant sentiment, et cetera. And Bernie actually weaves together a much more unifying message. There is a division, but the division is basically between the 1% and the 99%. So Bernie is trying to prove to working and middle-class people that government can serve their interests and doesn't just have to serve, in his phrase, the interests of the millionaires and billionaires. So that would generate, we think, a larger turnout, which would help sweep more Democrats into office. Yeah, it seems like turnout is a really important thing here. And um, is that, did turnout affect Trump's win as well? Was there a big turnout on that side um, for him to be able to have that surprising win in 2016? Uh, there was a low turnout uh, among a lot of groups uh, in that election. Um, one of the groups in particular, African-American turnout was very reduced. Now, the establishment people want to say that's because the Russians were targeting uh, black Americans to, to dissuade them. But I don't think Hillary encouraged them. I don't think they trusted her, not just on the basis of being black, but also on the basis of being working class. 
So I think that, um, yes, turnout was down. Hillary also didn't campaign in, in the so-called Rust Belt uh, states of the uh, northern uh, Midwest. And we lost those states very surprisingly. And that really uh, caused the election to go. And I think that an appeal that uh, appeals to working people, but working people of all ethnicities, not just white working class, I think will actually uh, increase our turnout. What will happen this time, uh, we'll have to see. But I think overall in the future, that's the appeal we have to make. The Democratic Party has become the party of essentially the liberal professional class and not the working class anymore. And I think that's a fatal weakness and has resulted in low turnout. We say that in Hawaii, the turnout in Hawaii is among the lowest in the, in the country. And the Democrats probably have more control here than in any other state. Yeah, let's, you know, let, I have so much to ask you about the national stuff, but let's get into the primaries for Hawaii, just so I don't miss that. Um, it's it's quite confusing for, I know I, like, I'm a millennial, a lot of my friends are just like, they don't know um, why it, it, there's so many steps involved with being able to register in the primary. So can you just explain that on a basic level, um, how one is to vote for the first time or um, in the primary specifically? Yeah, so the first thing people have to understand is that this election, we're calling it a primary for the first time. In the past, we've used the caucus structure. But this primary is not run by the government. It's not the Office of Elections. It's not the county clerks. It is being run by the party itself on our dime with our volunteers and our technology. Um, so in order to participate, even if you voted in the last, say, gubernatorial primary, where it was Ige versus Hanabusa, uh, that doesn't make you a formal member of the Democratic Party. And in order to vote in this upcoming presidential primary, you have to be one, a registered voter, and two, you have to join the Democratic Party. So in order to do that, people can do that online. It's fairly uh, easy. So there's the website there. And so if you go to the homepage of the Democratic Party, which is hawaiidemocrats.org, you will see in that little red circle that I've highlighted there, uh, there's a button, small button that says join. If you click on that, you will bring up an enrollment page, which is this page here. And you just fill out your contact information, date of birth, et cetera, and you submit that. And that will cause you to join the Democratic Party. Um, even though this is closed to anyone except for party members, it is very easy for anyone to join the Democratic Party provided that they are a registered voter and they have to say that they support the principles of the Democratic Party and will abide by our rules. Meaning if someone is a diehard Republican, for example, they cannot in good faith vote in our presidential uh, race. Now, what we have here is this is a mock-up of a ballot. Uh, this is not the real ballot. The real ballot is different colors and a different layout. But this is to give people an idea. We are using ranked choice voting for the first time, meaning you get to mark your first choice, your second choice, and your third choice. Now, the field is much smaller now. People are dropping out, but the ballot will still have a lot of those names if the candidates uh, drop, dropped out after a certain deadline uh, of, of a few weeks ago. Um, by marking that ballot, everyone should mark their first choice. And you can mark a second choice, and it's not going to help someone else defeat your candidate. It's not like there's an incentive to plunk like there are in some elections. You can, in good conscience, or you can just vote your first choice. Now, if your candidate drops out before the ballot is counted, or if your candidate fails to, to attain 15% of the vote, then your, your vote will be transferred to your second choice. Now, on our ballot, um, of people who are still running, uh, we may have at least one candidate who's probably not going to get 15% of the vote. So if you still in good conscience want to vote for that candidate, then go ahead and do it, but protect the strength of your vote by allowing your vote to then, if that candidate fails to get 15%, your vote will still count for your second choice candidate. So this process is being handled mostly by mail. So if people join by, I believe it's by March 8th, then they will get a ballot mailed to them. But it'll also be a walk-in voting. There will be a walk-in election on April 4th, which is a Saturday. 
and there will be 21 voting centers run by the party across the state of Hawaii. Uh, I think there are five on the Big Island. I think there are three in Maui County, one in Lihue, and I think that leaves 10 or 11 for Oahu. You can vote in any one of them. It doesn't have to be in your neighborhood. In fact, it doesn't even have to be on your island. And you will get a ballot and you will be able to mark and cast your ballot that day. And that vote, those voting centers will be open from 7 a.m. till 3 p.m. Lots of hours on a Saturday where one can stop by any one of these voting centers. If you are not a registered voter, you can register that day on site. If you have not yet joined the Democratic Party or you have friends who want to vote and they're not members of the party, they can go that day, fill out the paperwork, and then vote and leave. Okay. That was awesome. That's all the information I um, I wanted to cover for the local stuff. So that was really, really good. Thank you for covering that. Um, so I guess the main thing is just for convenience sake, for folks who don't hit that deadline, which is five days from today, they won't be able to do it by mail, which I think is personally the most convenient option, especially for people like young people and um, even elderly people who just need to or want to stay at home or don't have the time to leave work and stuff like that. Um, so do it by March 8th if you want to get it in the mail. And I'm guessing you need to mail it in before April 4th um, for it to be counted. Yeah. Is there a rule around that? Yes. Yeah. So and, and if they're worried in the final days or so, they can actually take it and drop it off in one of the voting centers. But those who want to have the convenience of mailing should mail it at least a couple of days before then. If it comes in on the 4th, I believe there's a cutoff period by maybe 3 o'clock or whatever, ballots will be picked up from the post office and those will be counted. But if it comes in after hours, then you're out of luck. Okay, and then for procrastinators out there, which I believe Hawaii has many of them, and you miss the deadline, you don't get your mail-in ballot, you can go April 4th day of to one of the polling centers um, anywhere on your island, and you can register as a Democrat that day um, and you can vote that day. Can you also register to vote that day as well, or do you have to have done yes, that before? Yes, you can register to vote. And we don't say register as a Democrat because that causes confusion. We say enroll in the party or join the party. Got it. Okay, good. Okay, well, good. That's so helpful. That that gives me a little bit of relief that people can do it that day if they do forget, because um, I know there's been a few deadlines that came up, so that's really helpful. Um, I do really want to push this idea of, I've been telling people you can vote in your pajamas, and this is the first year in the state of Hawaii that you can stay at home um, and get your ballot in your mail if you're registered and enrolled, and then do it all at home and do your research and talk to your friends and family members, um, and then just stick it back in your mailbox. So it's super simple to do, and I know for me, I'm in the ballot, like, on my phone researching, like, things, because I don't know about every single section of that ballot, so it'll... I'm really excited to vote by mail for the first time. Um, and that option is now kind of the standard for, for all the elections this year. Can you go through the dates in August and November and, and the dif differences of those that people specifically in Hawaii should know about and why maybe the primaries are more important than the general here in Hawaii? Okay, well, the first important distinction to be made is between the presidential primary that the party is running. And I gotta mm -hmm. say, we are hoping that the state will take over running of the presidential primary. It would require that there be a distinct and separate primary for the presidential um, run. Uh, we would hope that all parties would uh, use the, the um, presidential primary in the springtime. because It has to be in the springtime because we have to elect delegates to go to the national conventions, both Republican and Democrat, and those are held in the summer. So people have to be designated as you know delegates uh, and allotted proportion of the votes their candidate receive a uh, well in advance for that. So it can't be combined with the August primary that the state uses for other races. Um, so the, the August primary is, is again, it's not directly related to this, but there'll be a primary for your state house for U.S. Congress. Uh, you know, I, I don't think the U.S. Senate is on the ballot um, and the presidential race won't be on that ballot. And then in November will be the general election where people get to vote for whoever wins the various primaries, or in our case, it would be the nominating uh, process at the national convention for the presidential race. It'll either be, well, it'll be, it'll be a good candidate. Whoever we come up with will be a good candidate. I hope. And then just that piece about local elections in um, August and how 
we're a blue state and why um, that August election sometimes um, not matters more, but is, is more important than people think than the general. Can you just explain that a little bit? Well, yeah, you're, you're raising a good point. Because the Democrats win almost all the elections here, and right now Democrats hold, I think, out of the 51 House seats, I believe there are five Republicans, maybe there are six. If I blink, I might have missed one. Um, there is only one Republican state senator. Um, so the, the real contest occur in the Democratic primary. Uh, so I, I actually am of the school of thought, even though this may offend my friends who are incumbents in the legislature, I believe that uh, we have to shake up the legislature and elect better people, sometimes with fresh ideas. Uh, in my view, ideas that are less sort of in the um, aligned with the business community and more aligned with the interests of working people, uh, stronger protections for the environment, um, et cetera. Like right now we see the minimum wage bill, which allegedly the Democrats all are committed to support at $15 an hour as a step towards uh, a living wage. Uh, the Democratic leadership of, of the legislature has pledged they're not going to go higher than $13 an hour and they're going to drag, slow walk that out over four years to go into effect. Now that's offensive to most of us who are active Democrats. Um, I think perhaps it's going to require a little bit of shakeup in the House and in the Senate to put in Democrats who actually believe in the Democratic platform and in, in traditional Democratic values, rather than the yuppies that have taken over the big square building. Yes, exactly. That's how I feel too. And um, it's not the most popular idea if you talk to some folks who are entrenched, but I think um, looking at where we are in terms of our social and environmental issues, we need to move a lot faster than um, currently government is willing to move. So thank you for saying that. And um, last minute here, um, final thoughts. It's Super Tuesday, super important day. How are you feeling about 2020 um, and what, what should we expect moving forward? Well, today being Super Tuesday, it's like probably the most dangerous uh, day of the year for someone to be asked to prognosticate on what's going on. Um, I'm keeping the TV off and I'll wait hopefully until fairly late in the day before I start looking at the returns and see, uh, see what happens. Um, I've got my fingers crossed. I think you're right there, these multiple crises. I, I know you're doing a lot of work on environmental stuff, but I think that we have an you know, environmental crisis, we have international a national security crisis, we've been involved in these endless wars. Um, the uh, economic inequality in the United States is getting worse and worse. Um, we're, right now we're seeing our inability of our healthcare process, healthcare system to deal with uh, the danger of epidemics. Um, so uh, I think we have multiple crises and I think we have to start moving fast I think at both the state and the national level, there's just too much complacency by careerists who are only concerned with their own careers and the interests of their friends and those that donate to them and really don't share the views of regular working people. So we have to mix it up and put in more people who actually have the working class experience and face the same problems that other working people do. So they're more sympathetic to the notion that government can be an instrument to improve our lives. Yes. Well, I couldn't agree more. And that's our show. So thank you so much, Bart, for being on. And I hope I um, get to talk to you in person soon. Okay. Glad to be on. Thank you. Thanks.